Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining uh, my talk. Um, today I'm only going to give you a taste of what C++ coroutines are, uh, how they may be used in certain situations, and this is a very motivational talk. So it's much more about what, what problems, what kind of problems coroutines came to solve, and uh, the, what kind of abstractions they're really good at. Um, since this doesn't, won't go into a lot of the compiler magic that happens behind the scenes with coroutines, there are many additional resources. But I do hope to give you the enough uh, stimulation to go out and, and see and read more about coroutines because this is quite an amazing uh, new feature of the library. So let's start at the beginning. Let's say we want to iterate over a sequence. Can you actually see the code? Okay, so maybe you should move in a little bit. <laughs> or move out. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, but there are, there are a few uh, empty seats here in the front, so you can move in. Anyway, so let's say we want to iterate over a function, over a sequence of elements. So we can write a simple function like vectorate, and this is the function actually does two separate things. It iterates over I all each of the elements of the sequence. And then it performs some kind of operation on each of these elements. So in this case, case it prints them out to the standard uh, output stream. Now, if we wanted to do some other operation, let's say we wanted to sum all the elements together, or maybe we want to sum them and print them out, then we have to write different functions, uh, a, a different function for, for each of these uh, operations. Uh, so these are regular functions. And let's see another example. Let's say we want to draw a line on an image or on the screen. So we might go to uh, look up some uh, code on online and we find some uh, Bresenham algorithm for line drawing. And w the implementation will generally look something along these lines. And we can see that this function, again, it does two things. It calculates, it does the, it iterates over all the elements along the line. In this case, it will be pixel position because it's a rasterizer. So it will lazily calculate all of the, uh, each element of the, each pixel along the line. And then it calls this function called put pixel to actually draw the, some kind of color or value onto that pixel. Now, there is an implicit, assu several assumptions that go on about this function called put pixel. First of all, of course, it must be available in the scope so the, that we can actually find it. It has to have the correct signature, so it will uh, compile and link. It actually has to do what we expect it to do, namely put a color to the screen or put, put some value into a device. And there is another implicit assumption that we rarely think about. It actually assumes that it re returned uh, uh, to our function because we are in mid-computation. And nothing really guarantees that put pixel is actually going to return. Maybe it's going to uh, run forever or, or basically return uh, uh, the control flow somewhere else. So we can see that subroutines or functions, what we normally call functions, uh, actually have two properties which are inher inherent to their design. They're eager and they're closed. And closed is the sense that they only return after having performed a predefined operation over the elements, and eager in the sense that they want to operate on all the elements of the sequence before returning. So hence, they're both eager and uh, closed. Now, one common way to avoid the problem of a closed function is, of course, using callbacks. But callbacks aren't always, and, and in fact, C++ provides us uh, many different mechanisms for uh, writing callbacks. We have function pointers that go back uh, to C. We can use lambdas and we can use uh, callable template parameters and, and concept brings us another new mechanism where we can pass callable stuff and limit uh, its scope. But still, all of these callback mechanisms still suffer from uh, multiple different problems or they bring their own set of issues that we need to contend with. For example, inversion of control means that now we're passing our functions flow to some code which may not be valid, may not be trusted, may, be, may not be correct when we're still in mid-computation and we're, our state is not necessarily uh, something that we, need, we can let go of at this time. Another problem is commonly called callback hell. And this is 
frequently related to how we actually un understand or maintain or debug this code. Now, our lo the logic of our algorithm is being spread across multiple functions, and we have to start tracing the, l the actual running code within our head, and we see, okay, there's a callback, so now we go and check what this callback, what callback was actually uh, passed to the function, and check the implementation in that function, and suddenly the whole logic of our code is distributed between multiple functions, which makes it very difficult to maintain, makes it very difficult to read, makes it very difficult to reason about, and I'm not even discussing the, the additional costs of function calls when you're writing very, very tight loops or very um, performance-sensitive code. And even if we do use uh, callbacks, the code is still eager, so it still tries to run this callback over all the elements of the sequence. Now, the question is we can somehow break these functions open, and basically I like to think of it like flipping them inside out so that we can give the user the option to iterate over the elements of the sequence and not be tied to one particular operation that can happen on each of these elements, right? So, and of course the solution is something we've all known for many years. Uh, iterators give us exactly that kind of power. They were introduced by Stepanov in uh, 1993 and they became part of the C++ standard library in 1998. And in fact, the standard library has a whole bunch of iterator types. Now, iterator types have m multiple different variations, and some of the uh, uh, common terms that you might come across uh, are iterator objects or iterator adapters, and these are frequently standalone objects which are only very loosely t tied to some underlying sequence. And let's see some examples. Uh, we have STD iStream iterator, which iterates over all the elements of an input stream and getting them one by one using the uh, input stream operator. And we have the reverse iterator, which basically takes a regular iterator from a container and gives us the elements in, the, in reverse order. And these have been around since C++ 98, and C++ 17 gives us the recursive directory iterator. It belongs to the file system uh, namespace. And I like this example because it gives us all of the, the names of all of the files within uh, a, a folder hierarchy with all its internal subfolders. Right? It, it, it recurses into all the subfolders and gives us all the names. However, our program itself doesn't actually have a sequence in memory. There is no concrete object in our program that represents this sequence o over which we're iterating. In fact, it's only iterating uh, by using, uh, usually it's op some kind of operating system calls that to get the next file. So here we see again this loose coupling between an actual iterator object, which gives us the abstraction of iterating over objects, and some underlying sequence which is not necessarily an object within our system, and in fact uh, it might not be even, uh, in many cases it could be uh, very loosely defined or lazily computed, which we'll see in a minute. Now, of course, we can write our own user-defined iterators. We're not limited to the set created by the standard library. So let's take an example. I'm not sure you can actually read this, though, which is kind of unfortunate. Uh, but in this case, I'm looking at OpenCV. OpenCV is uh, the Open Computer Vision Library. It's an open source library for doing a lot of uh, image manipulation. And it has this class called CVLineIterator. And CVLineIterator has a very, very typical uh, iterator API, and that's why I want to I wanted to show it. It has a constructor. It has uh, uh, the dereferencing uh, operator to get access to the current pixel, and it has the increment operator, which allows you to go to the next pixel. And every time we call increment, the next position along the rasterized line is given by uh, would is made available to the dereferencing operator, and it has a whole bunch of state. Uh, in this case, they're uh, public members of the class. I'm, I'm not going to argue about having public members because that's not the point of this talk. Um, and as I said, uh, there is no uh, underlying sequence. There isn't a line object inside our program that gives us this, uh, these elements of pixels. Instead, the constructor takes two points and lazily calculates all of the intermediate positions using something like the Bresenham, uh, very, a lot, multiple different Bresenham line algorithm. Um, and we get this incremental access along the line, and how do we use it? Basically, uh, we can create the line iterator, give it two points, and 
in this example, I copied this example from the documentation. I can't even read it. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm copying the pixel values into a vector. So how do I do that? I'm creating a vector, and vec3b is the type of a pixel element. And then I'm using range 4. Uh, sorry, not range 4. There is a for loop. It starts from 0, and then it iterates until it.count. it.count is a member of our iterator class that tells us how many pixels to expect along this line. So we must not surpass this number. And the last one we get to, that, that's the, the end point of the line. And then we just copy the values into our vector. Now, in general, objects that lazily generate values in this fashion are also called generators. So if you're familiar with Python uh, and Python generators, this is essentially the same idea. Uh, and the same idea from the API point of view. However, iterators themselves, although they are a, a very interesting design pattern, iterators themselves are also an imperfect abstraction. They also have some problems related to how you actually implement them. So in this case, um, I want to refer to two problems that plague any, any implementation or anyone who has to, write, to actually write an iterator class. And I call them the awkward coupling problem and the distributed logic problem. And I mentioned them before, and we'll see some more examples. So the first question anyone who implements an iterator class needs to ask themselves is, how is the user going to know when they must stop incrementing, right? And in the four examples that we just saw, we actually have four different ways of identifying. So we saw a CV9 iterator has this it.count public member, which we must not uh, increment uh, more times than that. Uh, the iStream iterator class from the standard library becomes equal to the default constructor, the sort of universal iStream iterator whenever it's done, basically it re when it reaches the end of stream. And reverse iterator becomes equal to the R end of the underlying sequence. And the recursive director iterator becomes uh, equal to calling the standalone uh, std end function over this, the, uh, the iterator. So we've already, we already see four different ways. And of course, uh, we can invent many other different ways of doing it. But even worse. The fact that we need to do to pass two iterators of the same type to uh, say most of, uh, many STL algorithms is a problem is an API design, pro design problem in itself. So, can anyone tell me what's wrong with this code? One and L. One and L. Yeah. I so the keen sighted uh, uh, people uh, in the audience, you can say I have two vectors. One is called v1, and the other called is vl. And I'm actually passing, and they're of the, the same type. So when I'm passing v1.begin and vl.end, this code is going to compile. Because vend is of the right type, exactly as v1.end. And this code, is, that's of course undefined behavior. This, your program will hopefully crash uh, and not continue running or doing whatever. So we must think about the fact that STL algorithms require iterators. This is an API design problem. This is that, and that's the awkward coupling. We're passing on the responsibility of passing the correct iterators to the user of our class. Now, there is a solution, one solution to the problem uh, of awkward coupling, and that's the, the fact that those are ranges. As you know, as you may have heard, we're getting ranges in C20, and ranges are really an abstraction over the iterators. And they basically encapsulate in a single object, uh, they can encapsulate a start and end iterator so that when we pass them to an algorithm, we only need to pass the range and not two separate objects, which may or may not point to the same underlying sequence. They can also be constructed from an iterator in a size or an iterator in some stopping condition. And they're actually a very, very fabulous new feature of the language, which uh, has a lot of power, most of which I'm not actually going to talk about in, in this talk. And they can be composed in creating pipelines. However, when you're trying to implement a range, you still come upon the second problem that plagues iterators, because ranges are, in fact, an abstraction over uh, a, gen a generalization over ranges. And that's the problem of the distributed logic. Remember, we saw the API of CV line iterator before, and we saw the fact that 
we have a few methods, we have a constructor and a few methods, and a whole bunch of state inside as members of this class. So what happens is now the implementation of the algorithm is now split between the constructor, the, the referencing operator, and maybe the plus plus increment iterator. So when we try to debug this class, now we have to start jumping around our, our implementation and figuring out what goes where. And whenever we try to write something even more complex than a single line, maybe something that has multiple branches, and we have to start keeping the state along, because we're stopping in mid-computation at every iteration, we're basically pausing our program and, s and giving out the result, the in, uh, intermediate result. This makes it very, very difficult to track. A second problem, I call the centralized state, which is exactly that block of members. All of them are mutable members of our class and basically accessible to all of the uh, methods. So we're, we're giving up all the scoping rules and const, uh, uh, const correctness and a lot of stuff that happens in a regular linear function in order to have uh, the option to save the state somehow as members. Right? So the members in this case, they act like like local global variables for the methods. And, and again, this comes with the problem, the maintainability issue. So basically, we can do something really simple. We, as, as a trick, we can take the CV line iterator code implementation and just copy and paste the implementation of, of the constructor and then the, the, the body. I'm just copying and pasting the body of the implementations into this new function, which is called the uh, process line. So at the beginning, I'm just copying all the members, and now they're going to be local variables. Then I'm putting the body of the constructor, which is not shown here because it, the details aren't important. But essentially, they initialize all of these local, mem local variables. And then I can create, uh, explicitly write some the for loop inside the process line and copy the body of the increment iterator. So, but now, what did we do? We didn't gain anything uh, because we basically just lost the ability to have a lazily computed function, which uh, uh, we, which is eager again, right? So there it seems like we have this trade-off on the right. We have uh, this dri the distributed logic, which is hard to maintain and debug and read and reason about, but we do get the nice features of iterators or ranges which are laziness and openness. So the only the, the user, the external user, may decide what operation we need to make over the data. But when we go back to the, ser to the nice serial algorithm, ni and which is easy to read and easy to reason about, we're again stuck in a function, in a, in a subroutine, which is uh, eager and closed. So what can we do, right? So if, if only there was a way to write easier to reason about code in a serial linear way, but still get this uh, uh, somehow a way of obstructing the iteration uh, to the user. Now, that's where coroutines come. This is coroutines are essentially this is what they try to bring us, and you might be surprised that coroutines are not a new concept. In fact, they were introduced in 1958 for languages that, uh, you know, uh, uh, ancient languages. So, and uh, there have been uh, coroutine implementations uh, in many other languages, and even C, there are several libraries in Boost, and, and even C has some libraries that go back at least 20 years. So <laughs> it's not a new concept. And so let's ask a question, what is actually a coroutine, and how does it generalize the concept of a subroutine? Well, a coroutine is a function. That first and foremost, a coroutine is just a function. But it's a function that can suspend its execution in mid-computation. It's able to return some intermediate value when it's suspended. And it could be resumed later at some point in time that the user so chooses. Um, it has the ability to preserve this local state. And allows, re as I said, you can re-enter it more than once. And uh, it's an interesting aspect here is that it's non-preemptive. So it's not like, um, like threading. We're not using kernel, uh, the, the operating system scheduler, to pause some running program in mid-operation. In mid, uh, but in fact, the coroutine itself s knows when it's stopping. It, it, uh, whoever wrote it decides the, the uh, suspension point. 
But if you think about it, this description, which I just gave, is exactly what we wanted. We wanted something that can do some kind of computation and stop at certain points along, uh, we were drawing a line, so, and give this uh, pixel back at every iteration. So I just copied again, this is the process line function, and we had this, uh, uh, the last line inside the loop, which said do something. And basically what this is exactly what we want. We want, instead of calling some function do something, we can just yield this value that we calculated, halt or suspend our execution, and give the value to the user whenever the user wants the next pixel position, they will resume the coroutine. So how does that work in C++20? Well, it's actually very simple. Well, conceptually simple. And in C++20, a function is a coroutine if it has any of the following keywords. There's the co-await keyword, which suspends execution until it res uh, the uh, coroutine is resumed. We have the co-yield, which suspends and returns a value, and this is exactly what we wanted. And we have the coroutine uh, the co -return keyword, which allows us to complete running and return some value. Now, a very, very important thing to remember, and this is one of the most important things you need to take away from this talk, is that coroutines are an implementation detail of a function. So there is no way to tell a function from a coroutine based on its signature, only uh, by this rule, which says that it must contain one of these uh, keywords, which means that the when the compiler sees the body of the function, it will perform some magic and some code transformations to generate some code. But I can write a function that returns some coroutine support library type, which is not actually a coroutine. So if we're only seeing the, the signature of a function, if we're including it or reading it in the documentation, we can't actually know if that function is implemented using coroutines or not. But I in a sense, think about it this way. The problem of distributed logic, the problem of centralized state, was really all about implementation, about reasoning about the implementation of an algorithm, the implementation of, 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 of a function. So that kind of lines up very nicely, and we'll see some examples in a minute. And of course, the return types must satisfy certain requirements. There is an API defined by the standard, which these special return types must adhere to. Um, so let's look at the simplest code. So we have this function. It's called Zorro. And what does Zorro return? It returns 42. Can you, can you see the code? Yeah? returns 42. The return type is an int, right? And is it a coroutine? No, it's not a coroutine because it doesn't use any of the special magic words. Now we have this function which is called coro. What does this return? Hmm? Anyone? It doesn't return 42, right? And uh, uh, what's the return type? We'll see in a minute. And is it a coroutine? Yes, it is a coroutine because uh, we are we're using the coiled keyword, right? So it's not 42 and it's not int. And how do you use this uh, coro? So I have this range for loop, and we use it like we use any other iterator type. Remember, I just said that coroutines are an implementation detail, and the result of the the result of a coroutine is usually some iterable or some uh, object that we can use uh, uh, in this case as a generator. Or, or in this case, just inside uh, something that is an input iterator. So in this case, I'm just putting it in a range for loop as I would any other iterator type, and I can print out the values. Of course, there is a, I can break the for loop into a more explicit representation, and in this case, gen would be the return type returned by coro, which is a generator object in a suspended state. Then we can call be the begin operator, the begin uh, method to get the iterator to the first element of our sequence, and we can deref and print it out. Of course, this is the fr we only have one element, so we cannot actually uh, when we call s to the end, it will be equal to that, and we won't we're not supposed to increment it anymore because for the we only had co yield forty two, and we were done. Yeah, question. No, why do we need co-wait? This is totally synchronous. There is no. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm only going to talk. Uh, I'll see it. In, I'll show it in a minute. But 
basically in this talk I'm actually only going to talk about uh, synchronous code and in fact only focus on co-yield because I'm trying to give the motivation the underlying uh, co-yield is really syntactic sugar for co-awaiting on some promise uh, return value or something like that and co-return is also gets rewritten as something that uses co-await. So co-await is the real underlying mechanism but my goal with this talk is to give the motivational uh, and conceptual model that you need to use how to think with and use coroutines. So uh, it's not so much about and also in the, in the more and generator type of usage. So I'm not going to talk about asynchrony or concurrency at all in this talk. Right. So because we're calculating all of, uh, because uh, uh, generators can calculate everything lazily, so we're basically doing one iteration at a time, there's no problem defining infinite ranges because they're not going to be translated automatically into infinite loops. So in this case, we have this IOTA uh, coroutine and we, we can tell it's a coroutine because we're using co-yield and we're just looping over uh, an integer and incrementing its value. When it reaches the uh, max value, it will just wrap around again. But in this case, and then we can use uh, std copy n and co copy nine values lazily into the standard output stream. So again, we infinite ranges or infinite coroutines or generators are actually very common and very, very useful because we're leaving the decisions of how many values we want to actually take from the sequence to the user. So let's see some more examples. Uh, oh, before that, actually I have a confession to make. I lied to you. Um, this code that I just showed, although it does compile on Microsoft Visual Studio, it's not actually standard conforming. Because uh, coroutines do not support the auto return type. So, but it makes for really nice slides, and that's why I showed it. And in fact, in, in on uh, Microsoft Visual Studio, whenever we use auto as the return type with a co-yield keyword inside the coroutine body, then it gets uh, transformed to something called std experimental generator of t, which makes sense because we wanted a generator. It has this input iterator I interface, and it's very nice to use, and it works really nicely. However, there is no such thing as a std uh, experimental generator of T. And a very, very unfortunate reason we don't have that is that C20 is actually not shipping with any coroutine support library. It's only shipping with the underlying uh, scaffolding required by the compiler to create coroutines. Um, so depending on your environment, uh, you, m you will need to have to either write your own coroutine types, and there are some excellent talks ab uh, that explain how to do that, or use some existing libraries like Lewis Baker's excellent CPP core library or Microsoft's own experimental implementation. So remember this point because I may continue using auto, but you have to understand that this is just slideware. Uh, and although the c all the code I'm showing here actually works on, on Visual Studio, uh, if you use a different platform, you might have to to tackle some different issues. And remember that you may need your own uh, coroutine library or external one. So let's see a, a nice example. Um, a few years ago, I needed to write an application, uh, an image processing application, and I had to do some kind of computation on the neighborhood around the pixel inside a very large image. And one of the solutions that I came up with was to scan some kind of spiral around the pixel position until I hit one of uh, the closest neighbor. Now, the nice abstraction that I found to do it was to use uh, to use a coroutine, and I'm showing an example of, of a C++ twenty coroutine here in, in the function called spiral, and you can see initially there are some two local variables, uh, they're called x and y, and then I'm just doing an infinite loop over uh, uh, which is going to spiral from the, the initial position which would be z defaulted to zero zero and starting to loop around it now i'm not actually going to explain the details of, of the implementation because they're not important but the, the other reason that i'm not going to explain it is that had i written this range or, or or generator 
in the original way where we had to split the initialization between a constructor and, the incre uh, and an increment operator and then maybe some other dereferencing operator, it would have been even more difficult to understand how this algorithm works, whereas here all the code is nice and serial. We are doing some loop, calculating, uh, yielding the value, the position of the current pixel. You can see the first line, it just immediately yields zero, zero. And then it does some kind of computation to decide where the next pixel of the spiral is going to be. And to make the pretty animation, I actually wanted to change the color of the pixel for every iteration. So again, I went back to writing a coroutine. And this coroutine this time is not actually going to look at positions. It's going to do some kind of uh, uh, a circular transition around the hue channel of the color space, of the HSV color space. So in this case, I'm using OpenSV, and again, we're defining uh, two color images, RGB and HSV, because most displays don't know how to display HSV colors. We only have RGB, but in order to get these nice, pretty, uh, highly saturated colors, we want to work in a different color space. So we're using OpenCV to do some color conversions, and we're always we're calculating the next HSV value to give us a nice bright color, converting that to RGB, yielding the RGB value, and then continuing uh, incrementing the hue and, and so on and so on. And this, again, this generator will run infinitely as long as we call it. The step, the step uh, argument which defaults to one just means how fast the colors change. So, for example, in this animation it changes faster, so you can see it's a nicer gradient. So the question is, okay, so now we have these two generators and we want to actually draw these pixels onto an image. And how do we do that? Well, we did see before that we could use a range for loop for iterating over the elements of a sequence, but a range for loop can only work with a single sequence. There's no way to actually write a range for loop uh, for using two iterators. And of course, we could man not use the range for loop and try to use two, uh, these two iterators separately, but we're trying to run these two iterators together in tandem, lockstep, one by one, we're incrementing both of them. So there's a really cool function. If you've kind of done any uh, function programming, it's a very common function. It's called zip. And zip uh, will actually be a part of the range library. There, uh, there is also an implementation there. But Implementing it with coroutines is actually very, very simple, especially for this simple case of only two, of only two coroutines. And yes, zip takes it is a template. So now we can see that a, a, a coroutine doesn't have to be necessarily just a regular function. It can actually temp be a template type. And in this case, it's taking two coroutine types. In this case, two generators. It's taking the begin of both of them. And then it uses the, this exact the for loop or an iterating and incrementing both of them together ret and returns, but it doesn't return, it co-yields a pair of the, the element of the first range and the element of the second range. So basically we're co-yielding ranges, uh, sorry, co-yielding pairs. Now, in order to actually draw the image, we can write a range for loop. We can see the first line here with the structured bindings. So we're decomposing our pair into two, uh, our two variables, pause and color. So the first one, in this case, will be the position, the pixel position. The second one will be color. And on the right for loop, we can see that we're zipping the two spi that we're zipping spiral and generator, and getting them as a as a third coroutine, which gives us these pairs. We decompose them, and then we just print the colors to the which is very cool and very simple for such uh, a very small, uh, very small number of, of, of lines. And the code is very nicely separated. The zip is a very generic function. Of course, uh, the ranges v3 library has a much more generic one. You can zip uh, a variadic number of, of um, uh, generators and so on. So this is nice and colorful, but let's see uh, another example of where what we might do with uh, coroutines. So we all remember when we studied binary trees or tree structures in general uh, at, at uh, when we took our data structure class. And 
we know that there are three types of uh, tra three common traversal uh, policies for traversing of a tree. There's uh, we have the prefix, infix, and postfix. So let's say we have this class. It's called uh, um, uh, we have a, a tree. In this case, it's called a tree node, and it holds uh, uh, basically a, a pair of uh, children or, or, or um, of, of the tree of each node, the left and the right child, and the way we can write in this case, we can see this is the example for in order. So we have in order is now a method. So now we can see an example where a coroutine is actually a method of a class. And it's called in order. I'm checking if the left element, the left child exists. We're iterating basically on in on the in order of the left child. So there is a recursion. In fact, this is a recursion. And we're just yielding the value of the, the left child. Then we're yielding the value of the current node. And then if the right child exists, we're yielding the values of all the children that come from the right side. The, the implementation of pre-order is essentially the same, but the only difference is that we're moving, we're first yielding the current node's value, then we're doing it for the left and the right, and of course the post-order would be to yield the, the, the current value first, uh, last. So you can see this is very, very boilerplate and very typical, and it's very close to what you actually see in um, in uh, typical data structure books. But the recursion only happens inside the range for loop in a very, very elegant form. And we can write another method called order, which takes some enum, enum and decides which of the generators to return based on this enum. And the reason I'm showing the function order is because order is a method that returns a coroutine type, namely a generator, but is not in fact a coroutine in itself. And when we're using this data structure tree node, we can't actually tell which, that w remember I said coroutines are implementation detail of the function, so the fact that some function returns a generator or a coroutine support type doesn't mean that that function is actually a coroutine. So we shouldn't be making that assumption. And the way we use it, essentially, as you see here, we have a range for loop. We're taking the value and then uh, passing it the right order, and it will print the values of the nodes in order. Now, I think this is pretty concise and, and maps pretty directly to what you might find in most data structure book algorithm books. But in fact, if we're using the CPP Coru library that I mentioned before, there's a really cool uh, additional type called recursive generator. And in that case, recursive generator, instead of supporting co-yielding only the values that it gets, it can also co-yield itself where it essentially does the same loop that we saw before, where it iterates over all its generator, the given generator, and co-yield its value. And then, when we look at the implementation of in order, what we can see is essentially a three-line function where we're checking if the left child exists, and if so, we just yield the generator given by the, um, our method. And all the co-yielding is going to happen inside that generator recursively. So I don't think I've ever seen such an elegant implementation of in-order or pre-order or post-order, basically three-line implementation of each one of these. And this really shows the difference between the, these three policies, and I think that's a probably as elegant as you, as you may get. Now, you notice here that I said there is no standard library support for these coroutine types, and this is one of the examples where Lewis Baker decided that there is a cool new thing you can do with uh, recursive generators, and recursive generator is kind of more optimized for doing recursion, but it's still not in the library, and you may not find that option in some other library. So it's basically a library, a dependent library type. One of the, the ways I like to think about coroutines when I'm trying to understand what goes on and what happens, how I'm not going to talk about the compiler magic, but there, if you squint hard, they're kind of conceptually similar to how lambdas work. So both of them, in cases of lambdas and coroutines, we're writing something that looks like a function, and the compiler somehow creates this object, which is uh, 
gets these magical operations um, and uh, generated for it. So uh, it would be both operators and maybe some additional methods that are not operators. And but there are still some, uh, of course, inherent differences between them. But again, there are I in differences that if you squint hard, you kind of get a feel for how you... So when you're creating a generator, you're getting this object, and then this object conforms to some API. So a lambda will conform to... It's like a callable object. And, and uh, the coroutine conforms some to some additional API that's required b or defined by this coroutine support library. So, for example, Lambda's return types are usually unknown and unique, unless they're captureless in C20. Um, but again, we can't know the type, and it's unique for every implement, for every block of Lambda. In the case of coroutines, we're basically ge getting a coroutine type, a library type, which we know exactly what it does. The fact that it has different implement implementation means that there's some type erasure going on be underneath the covers, but we're Again, we're now squinting, so we're kind of going to gloss over that. Um, lambdas gives us something that is a callable. That's the concept. And at least generators are usually uh, um, usually give us something that have this input iterator API that we saw, that we can use uh, the support begin and end and, and so on. In lambdas, we're getting this object and the members of this object really represent whatever captures happened for, uh, from the lambda closure. In coroutines, the local variables of this function that we wrote, as we saw before, they become essentially the members, the, the, pub the private members of something called the coroutine frame, and this might actually be allocated on the heap unless the compiler can prove that it can allocate it on, on the stack. But again, we, we're seeing some similarities conceptually between lambdas and coroutines. I'm glossing over a ton of material here, but, uh, but again, it's important to m give some kind of feel for what happens. And of course, the logic in lambdas all happen in the operator, uh, paren operator, the function call operator. And in the coroutines, there is a compiler-generated state machine which calls a whole bunch of magic functions to get, uh, for example, um, if we creating a generator, then we get the difference, the reference function and the increment operator, but some other functions for asynchrony might have different a different API. Right. So we're getting C plus uh, coroutines with C plus plus twenty, but like many other big very big uh, features of C++, they're not entirely uh, perfect yet. Um, one of the things that we have to be careful with is a problem that's called dangling references. And if you've seen some of the earlier talks we had today, we saw some examples, even uh, Arno just saw, showed some example in the previous uh, talk. And I want to show this example. So. We have this function called, a, uh, this coroutine called explode. It returns a generator, it takes a, st uh, a std string by reference, and basically iterates over the characters of this string, and co-yielding them one by one. Our main function uses the uh, range for loop on the explode, explode returns a generator, and tries to print out the, uh, each of the characters one by one. Now, this function actually as the name implies, doesn't work. Uh, the, this is a, we have a dangling reference problem here. And why is that? Because explode is not a function that runs before the for loop begins. It actually returns some kind of object, a generator object, in a suspended state. So whenever explode, re explode returns here inside the range for loop, we're getting this temporary generator object, which then is bound and its lifetime is extended to the end of the for loop. However, this literal string causes, creates a temporary std string, which is passed to explode. B however, the body of explode doesn't actually copy the string because it's taking the string by reference. So by the time we actually try to access the variables, this temporary string is long gone and we have a dangling reference. So one very important tip when you're writing coroutines is, in general, just take the coroutine arguments by value unless you can prove 
that whatever they're using is actually going to outlive the coroutine. Because you have to remember, they start, you usually start in a suspended state and they can get to a suspended state and resume later. So lifetime issues are very, very critical with coroutines. And uh, this is just a screenshot from CPP reference about how temporary lifetimes are extended. And they even mention this explicitly. They say in, in uh, range for loop that beware that the lifetime of any temporary within the range expression is not extended. So we're saying the return value of explode is a lifetime extended. However, any parameters that are passed to it are not. And that's, that's the main problem that we're getting. That's why we're getting dangling references. Um, and so we're getting these really, really cool, this really, really cool function of C20 coroutines. And as I said, it's still not perfect. It's still just like, uh, you know, const expert, expert functions when we got them in C11, we could only have one return statement. And then with C14, we could do more. And C17, we could do even more. And C20, we, can, we now can do much more. So the same thing is probably going to happen with C20 coroutines. So at the moment, we've already seen that coroutines can maybe be temp templates. They may be uh, methods. And they're basically very, very similar to functions. However, they can't have uh, auto uh, aut automatically deduced return types because we don't know, because we don't have a standard library yet. Right? So there even if we wanted to implement auto as some kind of feature, we need to know what we want to deduce. And there is no standard library, there is no option to actually implement this feature. So this feature really depends on the fact that we should have a standard uh, coroutine support library. And in fact, a coroutine standard support library is one of the highest priorities for C23. And it's most probable that we will have at least some uh, important and, and useful types in the C23. Until then, we'll use support libraries, external support libraries. Um, coroutines cannot be const expert at this time. I'm not sure there is, uh, there is in any reason that they won't be in the future. Uh, we'll have to see. Probably again, depending on some support library. Um, they can't be. We can't have a co a coroutine constructors or destructors. And in main, in fact, can't be uh, a coroutine or whatever. I don't know what that. How useful that would be. Um, there are also issues with quality of implementation of the libraries. So I did notice the Visual Studio library versus, let's say, CPP Coro. Some of them, the generate, let's say, the std generator for um, MSVC cannot take a type by reference, whereas CPP Coro can. So if you're trying to be uh, cross-platform, make sure that your library actually supports uh, or runs on both on platforms. And the last thing is compiler issues. There is a lot of optimization going on in the background when we're using coroutines. So I mentioned that this whole uh, coroutine uh, frame is allocated on the heap. Unless the compiler can prove that it may be uh, um, placed on the stack. And there are many differences between the optimization capabilities of different compilers. I'm not actually going to show. Um, uh, any performance results now because officially C20 is not yet ratified and no compiler has said that uh, it actually support has full support for coroutines yet. So we'll have to wait until the standard is, is uh, ratified and then we'll actually see what compilers do and we can run some performance tests. But until then, it's more about uh, Visual Studio supports it, Clang supports it, and I think GCC also supports it, so with the, with the appropriate flags. You'll have to turn it on and, and play with it. So uh, a few resources. There is a very, very nice, massive list of resources that you can find about coroutines at this uh, GitHub page. It's updated regularly. I know that I gave this talk a couple months ago, and it's already listed there. So uh, Matt is actually imp uh, keeping this very much up to date. Uh, CPP Reference has a very nice page, incomplete, but very nice page about coroutines. Um, there is a uh, hash coroutines channel on the C++ Slack. Who here uh, has, uh, is on the C++ Slack? 
Okay, not enough. You should go and uh, uh, join the C++ Slack. It's a great way to ask, a great place to ask questions, um, a great way to reach many of the committee members, many of the paper authors, may, may many of the speakers that you see in conferences uh, and videos. So I, I really urge you to, to go and do that. And specifically, the Coroutine channel is a very, very responsive. So it's a great way to, to, to get information. I know I did when I was preparing this talk. Um, and actually, mo a, a, a lot more details about this talk are going to be on a blog post on, on my blog at this address. And uh, yeah, thank you. Any questions? Anyone? Could you please open the previous slide? This one? No, no. no. N next. This one? Just before and. Uh, oh. No, next. Next? Next, yeah. Next, next, next. This next. one? Next. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Open the last and. Uh, oh, this. Yeah. No, no, no. Next no. one. Next, next one? one? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I wanted to say uh, that you shouldn't use uh, capital C in the uh, word concept. What? Where? Here? Yes. Why? This is exactly what I meant. It's a joke about uh, decapitalization of concept names is in standard library. Oh, okay. But this is, uh, the font is not uh, fixed, uh, so it's fine. Thank you for a good talk. Uh, as for me, uh, the coroutines, the whole thing about coroutines, if we are not talking about all the asynchronous stuff, it's like, so the coroutines are like uh, syntax sugar uh, around the lambdas in C++. So they, uh, I like the slide to where you compared them both. So uh, in some cases, uh, the coroutines uh, look like really great replacement for lambdas, like for cases when with generators. But uh, I think uh, for the cases when we, for example, when we capture something by the reference, so we want to modify something in lambda outside the context of lambda. So we still better use lambdas. So um, what I want to say is seems like the coroutines are not the complete replacement for lambdas, but they're for some set, subsets of the cases when we, for now, we have to use lambdas because we have nothing better. But uh, since C++ 20, we seem to have both, uh, we seem to need both lambdas and coroutines, and each of them have their own area of uh, appliance where they are best options. What uh, do you think? Okay, that was a statement, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. give you my my <laughs> uh, yeah, my take. Yeah, I don't I don't agree. Okay. Coroutines are not syntactic sugar for lambdas. Mm -hmm. Lambdas are syntactic sugar for function objects. Coroutines are syntactic sugar for implementing multiple different types of of well types of APIs, and that means in the case of generators, they allow you to write iterator, input iterator types, for example with begin and end and all of that gets automatically done by your library. And so as I my table where I showed this, it's more about how to think about things generated, but they're not, you cannot create an iterator type using a lambda. It only has one method, yeah. right? Absolutely. But uh, the, yeah, I mean, the most of uh, the code which we have with Coroutine, we could implement with lambda. But yeah, we have to implement also some support classes like iterator type and so on. So yeah, it's it's much m more than just a, a, a wrapper around lam Lambda. But for sure we could implement Lambda with, uh, so we could implement Coroutine with Lambda, but yeah, with some additional types, simple types like, like iterator. I, I think that the Lambdas and Coroutines are orthogonal. Okay. And the fact is that you can write a coroutine lambda. It's they're not uh, alternate to, to each other. I mean, maybe you could achieve particular uh, 
things with either lambdas or coroutines, but they're different. One is a hammer and the other is a saw. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, but okay. uh, for now, we, uh, in, for example, in C++ 17, we need to use hammer for everything. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, words. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, thank you for speech. Uh, my question is, uh, y you mentioned that uh, you couldn't provide us any information about uh, performance, but still uh, you've mentioned uh, MSVC implementation that uh, uh, requires some type of ratio. That means that uh, current coroutines uh, use uh, virtual calls and they are quite uh, inoptimal. <laughs> no, 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 not exactly. Um, in fact, there's an, a great talk by Gore Nishinov, who originally proposed the Coroutine talks, where he shows that it compiles to, it in certain cases, and all of the cases I showed here, which are synchronous generators, will be optimized by the compiler into serial code. Uh, is it due to the virtualization? The type erasure happens at a different level, at the, co at the, at the place where the compiler actually does the optimization. So uh, it happens quite low inside the compilation process. So it's not user-defined type with, with virtual functions. It uses a lot of built-in stuff. So the compiler knows a lot. It's just that you don't see it. In certain cases, you will get a diff, re diff referencing through a pointer. Um, but you know, it, it's not that you could have implemented it without it. So, you S so uh, as I understand, uh, it's uh, optimal, but um, OK, the second question. Uh, may I return uh, coroutine from several as, as an interface? May I use auto return type, not, not auto, but uh, some specific return type to return uh, coroutine uh, from different implementation that uh, has to return coroutine? Uh, uh, please repeat the question. I, I want to return a sequence. I want to return a sequence, and I want to return a coroutine as uh, an entity that uh, implements that sequence. I may I return, uh, and I have several um, producers of that sequences. May I return a coroutine? Uh, yeah, this is what, if I understand correctly, this is what this method does. There's a s it does a switch over some enum and returns the generator from three different methods. And the return type is the same. OK, is that what you meant? Maybe. <laughs> I'll think. OK. More questions? One question. Could you go to the next slide with the table with comparison with yeah, this one? And uh, you wrote uh, on heap. And does not mean that all object that we allocate in coroutine that are allocated on heap? I mean it right. means that the 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 coroutine frame it's where the coroutine object stores the the local variables. When you write the serial code, they look like local variables, but in fact they're variables that need to be maintained between suspension and resuming. So they become like members of some compiler generated class, uh, and that stack is uh, like in general it's allocated on the heap because it cannot, the curtain might be passed on to another thread or it might be passed on to some other function. Yeah. So it needs to be allocated on the heap and not on the actual stack of the calling function. However, in certain use cases, the compiler can prove that the curtain never outlives the scope, outlives the scope of the calling function and then it can just store it on the stack. And uh, when are they are destroyed? When we destroy a generator object? That's why I like the lambda comparison because if you see that it's a similar thing, they're destroyed when they when the generator object goes out of scope. Okay, and if we copy this generator object, what is going to happen? Well, that really depends on the API and the design of the library object type. <laughs> so some of them may be copyable, some of them might not. It depends. Um, so, like some most things, it depends. Some reference counts. <laughs> hmm? Sorry. Uh, may they be reference counters, for example? Actually, you can. I think you can copy them in general because uh, there is. It's just a pointer inside the object itself. But you have to make sure that you don't destroy it more than once or so. I think they're movable for sure. 
in your examples, you used on uh, core yield only. When, yes. do, when do we need core return? Uh, I think in many of the uh, core return just is li like the first example that I showed, the simple function Zoro I could use core return here because it's I'm ending the the, the run. Isn't core return uh, just a syntax uh, sugar for core yield and then returning from function? No. Mm, yeah. Okay. You can. Yeah. Uh, do we need uh, another um, algorithm uh, library in standard which implement coroutine interface, like the standard algori algorithm which produce like a sequence and so on, so on? Well, these are that's the standard uh, coroutine support library, but they're not algorithms. They're ju they're special types that give you a the APIs that you may want to use, uh, like generator. When we use uh, uh, algorithm library, we, uh, you work with I iterators and so on, and uh, how, uh, how today uh, oh, oh, oh. communicate uh, coroutines? Well, coroutine, yes, coroutine generators, they interact with ranges beautifully. They compose okay. with ranges, and they will work with all the, the range library algorithms. Thank you. Yeah. More questions? Oh. Can we make a uh, coroutine from Lambda? Can we use co yield inside Lambda? Yes, I think we saw an example. Yes. Uh. And what certain type will be? Or maybe there is no example, but yeah, no. a, a lambda can be a coroutine. More questions? So I think it is the end. So thank, thank you, you for much. our presentation. Thank you.